My name's Tom. I'm a board member at NAFI. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my experience in the United States Air Force and then how to take some of those tips that I learned and apply them to general aviation. There's my uh, email if you need to get a hold of me. There's some cards up there. Feel free to take pictures of anything on the slides, and I'm sure everybody can hear me okay in the back. You all are good. Uh, and as we walk through this, you'll see a yellow uh, text box on the bottom of the slide, and that's what I like to call the bottom line. So if you can't remember anything, if you're about ready to pass out, just remember what's in the yellow box. Um, exactly. Okay. Uh, I'll give you a little quick overview of, uh, of myself, and we'll go through all this. But since it's hot, humid, and they just play the Airwolf theme, Brian's going to be kind enough to click that link. So as he brings that down, uh, that's a clip from a Nat Geo series called Inside Combat Rescue. And it was showcasing pararescue men who ride in the back of the helicopter he used to fly. It's a heavily modified version of a, of a Sikorsky Blackhawk. And that was uh, scenes from Afghanistan during that, during that conflict. I was the guy in the front delivering those PJs to pick up the wounded on the battlefield. Uh, and I recommend, if you want to know anything more about US Air Force Combat Search and Rescue, the lineage, the history, what we did, and all that stuff. Uh, I recommend watching that. I think you could find it on any kind of streaming service. But that's what I used to do. So that's kind of the basis of some of these tips in a crew environment at night, low level, in the dark, in a foreign country, trying to get in and get out as quick as possible. I also had some other experiences that we'll talk about. And before I move any further, please feel free to stop, ask questions, comments. I have a tendency to use acronyms quite a bit. Uh, so if I say something that doesn't make sense, just raise your hand and we'll get going from there. And like I said, there the bottom line goes in the, uh, in the text box down there. So a little bit of background about myself as I click through this. I grew up in New Jersey. I don't con currently call uh, that my home, but I learned to fly at McGuire Air Force Base. My dad was a reservist, so on his weekend drills, he would drop me off the Aero Club and say, go figure it out. Back then, I think the, the fee for the 152 was $35 wet with an instructor. That was a long time ago. Mowing grass, shoveling snow, delivering newspapers. And like most of us pilots, we ran out of money. I went to Kent State University in Ohio uh, and went through the ROTC program there and the flight program as well. And then I did 25 years in the Air Force, uh, retired as a colonel. And the majority of my time was spent flying those helicopters, did some staff work, uh, bought the new, heli helped the Air Force buy the new helicopter, which is the Whiskey model, another modified version of the Blackhawk, um, and then did some light fixed wing in the Air Force. I had an assignment to the Air Force Academy where I trained the cadets how to fly a Cirrus 20, basically get them up to solo. Uh, so that's, uh, that's my fixed wing experience uh, in the Air Force. I've been teaching since 1997. I taught at the Air Force Weapons School, which is our version of Top Gun. There's a picture of the helicopter, uh, and right now, uh, I just left a part 141 school as a Czech airman in, uh, in coastal Virginia, in the Yorktown, Virginia, where I currently live. And now I'm a corporate pilot for a part 91 company. You get to fly anything from a King Air C90 up to a Citation Sovereign. So lots of different things, uh, different makes, models, categories, and classes. Uh, so as we walk through this, we're going to kind of step through the pre-flight phase, the in-flight phase, and then the post-flight phase. And really, as I go through this, again, these are some of my experiences that I've learned from the military that really translate well into the general aviation uh, 
realm and feel that you're all in. And real quick, before I get any further, who here flew into Oshkosh? Oh, wow. All right, that's pretty good. That'll become important later. So here's your warning. You'll be called on. It won't be a quiz. It'll just be about your experiences so we can make this interactive. So in pre-flight, right, we got to know ourselves. One thing we, we were taught in the military is know yourself, know your limitations and your capabilities. We've all had instructors that made tremendous impact. I remember my first instructor. He was an Air Force colonel from Vietnam, very large man, and he just had the most humbling attitude. And I couldn't figure out, you know, what the previous gentleman was talking about, slow flights and stalls and stuff like that. Yes, I was one of those original pilots. It took 12 minutes to get into slow flight because I was a little worried. But, again, he taught me how to know myself, and that carried with me throughout my Air Force career. And in the Air Force, when we start planning missions like you just saw in that video, we tended to put stuff in a box, right? We all, is any here, anyone here work full-time or part-time or still go to work to pay the bills? Yeah, reluctantly, so do I. I did not win that billion-dollar scratcher a couple weeks ago. But in the Air Force, what it taught us is, hey, when we're getting ready to fly a mission, we put stuff in a box. And that could be a distraction. That could be a duty. It could be yard work for you. It could be the dog is sick, the cat's sick, the water heater just blew up. Right before I came here, we decided to remodel one of our bathrooms. That usually doesn't go well, and it didn't go well, so I left and went to Oshkosh. But I'll pay the price when I get back. But I had to put that in the box, and my wife, who's smarter than me, learned to deal with that. But we had a 96-hour planning cycle in the Air Force, so if we were going to deliberately fly somewhere to go pick somebody up and we had the time we would start planning 96 hours out. Sometimes that's not only the reality. In that video you just saw, we didn't have 96 hours, we had about nine minutes to go respond and pick somebody up. So we had to learn how to kind of compartmentalize all that material, but then also deal with that, uh, that issue when you got back. And really what this is, kind of the takeaway, is to limit your distractions in the pre-flight phase. And again, knowing yourself and knowing your capabilities. If you can transfer work duties, if you run a company or if there's somebody else, a partner with you or doing something else, give that person the cell phone going, I'm flying to Oshkosh, I'm flying over here, I'm working on my rating, I'm working on my, uh, my flight review, I'm getting a new, tr a new training, a new certificate or whatever. And really, and I think it was Eisenhower, uh, it might have been George Marks who said, a plan is useless, but it's the active verb of planning that is useful. So whatever you have found, and again, for those folks that flew into Oshkosh, you know when you started. In fact, just by show of hands, how far out, three months, did you start planning to come in here, or was it a year, or two days? Just curious. Two days? Perfect. Ten months? Okay. Any first-timers flying in Oshkosh? Awesome. How far did you out start planning? Yeah, there you go. Because uh, I think the NOTAM is, what, 50 pages or something like that? It's, it's pretty active. I haven't had that opportunity. But again, you, you took the opportunity to, to study, prepare, and plan, and that's a very similar thing that we did in the Air Force. Again, it's, a, it's about the verb, the active verb of planning, and whatever habit and process that works for you. Some folks look at a map first, some folks look, you know, plan backwards, going, okay, I'm going to land here, I'm going to go to the North 40 and park the airplane, how am I going to get there, what are my divert options? But whatever it is, develop your process. And then secondly, we're always training, right? A good, a good pilot is always learning, as Ben Affleck said, and I think that's very true. And when we're in the Air Force, we're always doing training, 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 just like we're doing this, you know, in, in general aviation. We're always training for something. We're always watching those skills, sharpening. And in the Air Force, there's really three types of training. And I'd say that's also true for general aviation. There's the initial training. If you're buying an aircraft, you're going to get initially trained in a Cirrus, a Bonanza, you know, maybe a Vision Jet or something like that or whatever. You're going to learn the capabilities, the limitations. You're going to study the AFM. You're going to find a smart CFI to go with you. And then continuation training is basically, okay, I've got my quals. I'm an instrument instructor. I'm a private pilot. I'm a light sport, whatever. And now I'm just really perfecting what I'm doing, and I'm learning and I'm processing. And then there's the upgrade. Hey, I'm going from a, a uh, Bonanza to a Baron. I'm going from an SR-20 to an SF-50. I'm going from a 152 to a 182 or a 206. Uh, but remember that the key thing and the key theme that you'll see throughout this is that you are all responsible for your training. When I instructed a little bit more actively than I do now, I would tell my students on day one, I said, you're in charge of your training. I'm going to help you get there, but we're going to develop this process where 
by a certain number of flights. If let's say you're working on your private pilot halfway through the program, you've done your solo, you've done your cross country solo, you should be telling me what we're doing next. And I want them to take charge of that training because I shouldn't care more about your training than you should. Sometimes that resonates well, sometimes it doesn't. Obviously you gotta know the syllabus. If you're following one, the ACS, there's ample discussion on whether the ACS is the minimum. Who here thinks it's the minimum? Yeah, just to pass the check ride, right? Okay. Uh, and then after that, it's really up to you of how you determine your training. Obviously, there's a long discussion, what's legal, what's safe, uh, and then uh, proficient and personal. We'll get to that here in just a second. You know, personal mints. Who here has personal mints? Perfect. When did you first start developing them? When you first started flying? Yeah. Do they change? Are they dynamic? Are they static? Yeah, they might be. Might be because of the airport you're going to, the airspace you're going to. I know when I fly the jets that I fly for the company I fly for, we're part 91, so we follow those minimums. But there's been times where I'm with a more experienced captain who's got thousands of hours in the jet that we're flying. And I watch what he does, because he's mentoring me whether he realizes it or not. And I watch his decision making. He has certain mins, and you know we could have gotten this one airport. He calls the boss and says, hey, boss, I don't like this. Yeah, we got the runway, but the crosswinds right at the limit the, you know we're empty he goes just park it at the other airport we'll figure it out tomorrow that's good that's culture i encourage you if you fly in a flight club or an aero club or a flight school or with a partner i encourage you to have those conversations uh and look at them quite often you can set a, a cadence or a pattern for how often you uh, you review them find a cfi use a uh, a flight simulator ppc has got some wonderful simulators over there as well and again, I'll, I like to say, here's the foot stomper. I think one of the first ones, you know, the pre-flight steps you take will probably determine the standards of the flight. So if you, if you half-bake the planning, it's probably going to be a half-baked flight. Or you're probably going to be playing catch-up. Oh, crap, I forgot to charge my iPad. Oh, I forgot to download the current chart. That's eh, okay. It's just a 10-minute flight. Eh, okay, maybe not. Okay, be mindful of these stages. There's a video coming up here. Um, okay, so can anyone name that movie where that clip is from? There you go, right? Uh, he's on student on check ride day, right? And then it continues, you know, how I feel after a perfect landing, right? So these are mindful of these stages. There's a little shout out to Brian's dad, the proficient pilot, right? We always want to avoid that complacency barrier, right? Going, eh, I've just done this. There's a difference between competent Confident and cocky. We all know what those differences are. I recommend that you, if you don't know where you are, where your line is, find someone that you can go along with to help you out with that. Don't want to be there. That's where you'd like to be. And I think if the video comes up, can you click that video, gentlemen? I don't know if you can. Is it? You're everyone's problem. That's because every time you go up in the air, you're unsafe. I don't like you because you're dangerous. That's right. Man, I am dangerous. All right, Tom Cruise is pretty cool. But you don't want to be the danger. You don't want to be that guy or that gal in the pattern. So be mindful of those stages. And again, proficiency right in the middle is, I believe, a personal item. In the Air Force, we had certain requirements. We would have to do certain approaches every day, every week or every month. We'd have to go do air refueling at night. We'd have to go do these approaches called brownouts. You'll see that here in a minute, landing in dust and sand and really bad conditions because we had to maintain our proficiency. That was sometimes there's currency, then there's proficiency. And again, the proficiency, in my view, is very personal. You know what you're not good at, and you know what you're good at. And we'll get into that here in just a, just a few minutes. Okay, know your aircraft. When's the last time you read the POH, the AFM, cover to cover? It's okay. I haven't read the ones I fly for, too, all the way, uh, but that's okay. So when you have time, you don't have to eat the whole elephant at once. Just pick a little bit at a time. Make a study plan, right? Your emergencies, uh, it's probably if it hasn't happened, it's probably going to happen. And I mean, the airplane's going to catch on fire, fall out of the sky, hopefully not. But in the military, we have this thing. We, could, we make them matter. You can see the little play on words. Maintain, analyze, take control, uh, take appropriate action, refer to the checklist. You can see I've kind of made a checklist for myself over there. Feel free to take a picture of that, but 
big thing is, you know, one thing they taught us in the military is take your time, wind your watch, take a deep breath. Brian and I were just joking. He goes, have a cup of coffee, see what's going on. Uh, but big thing is just fly the airplane, see what's going on. You know, you can see them keep calm, take deep breaths if you need to. No fast decisions or hands. There's ample stories of people shutting down wrong engines uh, on multi-engines. Fly the airplane. And sometimes, what does that mean? That means fly the airplane, fly the aircraft. And again, it goes back to knowing your capabilities and knowing your airplane. Analyze the situation. Look at your data sources. Gain understanding. What's the panel telling you? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? What does it sound like? Uh, I had one where I was instructing where, the long story short, was the number three cylinder that was getting ready to go. We were doing this climb up to altitude to do a steep spiral with one of my commercial students. He's got the throttle full forward in a 172. Uh, we should get about 23, 2400 RPM or so. We only got 21, and it just did not feel and sound normal. Long story short, we wound up making it back, and just as we got off the runway, the engine quit, and we found out that it was the number three cylinder that was stuck. And we're coming back uh, over a long distance that was unpopular. Ask others what they see if you have somebody with you, if you have a spouse, partner, friend, another pilot. Hey, what do you think is going on? Because sometimes all the EPs are not going to happen the way they say in the book. Diagnose the problems. If you've got a towered field and you've got a gear problem, do a flyby. Right? You can ask somebody else to come up and take a look at you. Brief the formation, of course. Take appropriate action. Look at all the options to solve it. If you have a standard operating procedure, follow that. If you don't have an SOP or know what one is, come see me or Brian. I think he's done some great presentations on that. And let someone know your plan. You can even say that out loud to yourself. Hey, I'm going to fly over here. I'm going to enter the downwind. I'm going to do this. I'm going to put the gear down. If that doesn't work, I'm going to do this. Refer to your checklist. Follow up with the procedures. Ensure your actions. And then really debrief what, what happened and learn, uh, learn from those situations. All right, we're still in the pre-flight phase. EP of the day, here's another thing we did in the Air Force. The first of every month, we would do bold phase. We'll get into that in a second. But we would also... Uh, do an EP or an emergency procedure of the day. So every morning we'd have morning stand up and it's basically, okay, everyone here is in the squadron. We're going to go fly. We do the weather, the NOTAMs, the ranges, a, an intelligence brief, what's going on in the world. But we'd also pick an emergency procedure of the day. Okay, what does that look like? Well, we'd walk through and talk through a simulated emergency. Anybody ever done this or heard of this plan program? Okay, cool. So, so, I'm, uh, so it's resonating a little bit. This is an EP or an emergency procedure of the day when I flew Cirrus 20s, the Air Force calls, and the T-53 at, uh, at the Air Force Academy. So if we were flying today on the 27th, we'd go down here to the far right near the bottom and we'd talk about, okay, if we had to do a, an off-field pattern and landing. Okay, so we'd talk about that. And we would sometimes, in the Air Force, we would stand up in the middle of the room in front of all of our peers and they'd say, okay, Tom, you're flying along and your engine quits. You have the aircraft, you have the airplane, you have the helicopter, and you stand up and you, you'd read from the checklist, they'd evaluate your knowledge and your decision making. It might be a little heavy handed for a, a flight school or for an aero club or for a partner, but the point and the premise still remains is that you can talk about this any day of the week. You know, there may not be 31 days, you can adjust it from there. But again, it's really to, to cement that behavior and get yourself into those books. So on the 1st of August, right, another thing that we would do is uh, we would do boldface. So in, in the corporate world, they call it memory items. The Army, if you're familiar with that, they call it the underlying items. It's basically the immediate actions of the airplane, right, engine failure, stuff like that. I've kind of taken the acronym for BOLD, right, and the first of every month, we would fill out, we would write out the boldface, the emergency actions, and when we flew helicopters, we'd have to know how to, if, the, if you had both engines fail, You'd have to know how to auto-rotate. So we ran through these, these five items uh, on that. If we had an engine fire, if we had a tail rotor malfunction, any kind of immediate actions. But we would do the bold face. So again, there's the, there's the T-53, what we did in the Air Force. So you can see on the first of every month, we would fill out this form, handwritten, and spaces, period, dots, capitalization, it had to be perfect. Again, might be a little a little intense for general aviation, but, but the, the behavior pattern that it instilled in us is we knew the first of every month we were gonna be responsible for that. Now we studied it before as well, but we had to do that and here's the bonus. If we didn't get it right, we didn't go fly. We get to sit in the room and basically practice this. You've probably seen the Bart Simpson where he's writing on the chalkboard, I will not, yeah, that was us. 
in, yeah, thank you for good sound effect. Um, you know, for aborting a takeoff. And in the corporate world, I just went to um, Citation 500 training a little bit earlier in the year, and I think there's 20 memory items for the 500 series. That's a lot of memory items. Did we have to know? Them? Yeah, because during the oral, he's going to say, okay, tell me about this, tell me about that, tell me about that. Um, and so I challenge you, you know, one thing to take away from this is whatever you're flying, go read your POH. And all this is, is a Word document that I just created on my own over the first of every month, and I kind of do this. You know, in our, in our aircraft that we have, we have flashcards. You can download it uh, through flight safety, stuff like that if you're in the corporate world. But again, we wanted to, and the whole point of this is that we, we cemented that behavior of the first of every month. We wrote down the bold face. The next thing we did, it, there we go, is the ops limit. So there's the OL, so the operations limits. Yes, building, there we go, perfect. So that's the, that's the panel that we had on the T-53. Kind of hard to see, but you can see down here, you know, the oil capacity, the magneto check, operating temperatures, the air speeds, and we quizzed ourselves the first of every month. We did that as instructors. We also did this with the cadets because we wanted to get them in the habit pattern of doing this at the beginning of every month. You can do this every day if you really want to. Might get a little old and it might have a negative effect, but that that's what we would do. And then the decision-making, we would do that EP of the day in a stand-up scenario, and we talk about decision making. And then when I was, you know, when I was the student or whatever in the Air Force, or when I was flying um, in the squadrons, someone would talk about it. And in a crew aircraft, you can kind of phone a friend, and you would have the flight engineer or the enlisted air crew member read the checklist. And then once we were done, we talked about it. We talked about our decision making. We gave them a scenario. We said, hey, what would you do differently? Okay, that's some good thing. Anybody have anything else? Yeah, well, I would have turned towards this airport. I would have gone to Fond du Lac instead of uh, Milwaukee. I would have come here. Or I would have just tried an air restart and set the, set the glide speed sooner. Okay, cool. Sometimes there isn't a right or wrong answer. Other times it's, it's very black and white. But again, it had the benefit of everyone learning from what you were going through because we're all going to have our chance up front, okay? So again, be bold, and, and, I, and I recommend, you know, be bold in the first month. So August 1st, I think, is Tuesday. So if you're flying an airplane, maybe try this. Just grab your POH, write down the ops limits. When's the last time you did that? It's okay, you know, this is a confession, you don't have to tell me. But you might remind yourself going, oh, hey, there is a, I didn't know about the cylinder head temperature. I didn't know about the airspeed. Or, hey, maneuvering speed is this. Or if we get into turbulence, this is the airspeed and I need to set, or here's the, uh, the manifold pressure issue, something like that. And again, the whole point of this long conversation on this stuff is to build those habit patterns, because when you do have an emergency, you probably want to know what to do uh, rather quickly. You can chair fly, right, sitting in a chair, look, at, sit in the airplane, go over that, uh, and study your POH. And again, you know, the bottom line is knowing your aircraft and yourself gives you a capability, but it's not ready. It's, Right, it gives you those knowledge, uh, knowledge items. Okay, so moving on into in-flight operations. The previous speaker talked a lot of good things about flight reviews, right? We get uh, flight reviews uh, are required. But I would say, again, the theme is what do you desire to keep yourself sharp? Our, uh, our next video, as we get ready to go here, is there was this thing we did, and you saw a little bit of it in that previous video. We had to, we were deployed in the Middle East, right? Afghanistan, Iraq, other places. There's a lot of sand over there, and the sand is, is pretty much, it's like talco powder. It's very fine, gets into everything. And when a helicopter lands in dust, it creates a gigantic cloud. And when you're in a cloud of dust, you can't see anything. Okay, sounds like a problem. But there were ways to combat that. And so we started off, we start, when we were training, we started off on the daytime on a hard surface. So we got down our, our cadence and our calls and our pitch and power settings. And then we went into a daytime, we called a brownout pit, basically turned up dirt. And, and then we did nighttime hard surface, and then nighttime brownout pit, because that's where their survivors were. That's where we were going to pick people up when they would get injured on the battlefield. And we finally developed a currency and a proficiency program. But when I first started to learn how to do this, when I came in as a young lieutenant, we did it completely different. We tried to roll the aircraft on as fast as possible, because it's a Blackhawk, so it's got wheels and try and get ahead of the dust cloud. Well, when we started ripping things off the bottom of the helicopter, I'm like, yeah, that's probably not a good idea. So we changed the way we did it because we learned, right? We're always learning. And brownouts are, 
can be very terrifying. And so the video I'm going to show you is just, it's, it's not me, it's just something I found on the internet, but it's, it's, it's really what, what we're describing is, and we had to be very good at this, and I'll tell you a story here on the back side of the video. And that's daytime. So here's the so what. So we had to get good at brownouts. Quick, quick war story. So I was in Afghanistan. We we're picking up um, a vehicle. There was a vehicle column that got hit by an IED. And, it, and the, the TACP, the, the guy controlling us into that airspace, says, hey, and it was nighttime. He go, no, it's daytime. Pardon me. He goes, hey, put your right wheel of the helicopter on the smoke. There's a little smoke grenade, you know, yellow or whatever. Put your right wheel on the smoke. Oh, oh okay. You know, it's, it's hot like this, sweat and all that stuff. Right wheel on the smoke. Okay, so we set up on the approach, very similar to that, in the middle of Afghanistan. And we're like, okay, right wheel on the smoke. Okay, got it. You know, thankfully nobody was shooting at us. It was relatively calm. And when we get there, the team goes out. They pick them up, the PJs that I showed you in that earlier video. They go out, they pick up the patient, get them stabilized. We take back off, come back. Okay, we'll get the patient to the higher level care. He survives, everything's good. We come to find out later that the team talked to the ground controller, says, hey, what? What's up with the smoke? Why do we have to land there? Oh, it was a minefield. Oh, well, thanks for not telling me that. But the point being is we had to be good at the brownouts because if we would have been left or right a number of feet or a number of inches, things probably would have gone different. So again, for you as general aviation pilots, find the thing that you're not good at or that you want to be better at and just keep practicing, practicing, practicing. Uh, yeah, I'm glad they told us that story after. Uh, okay, click. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Any questions? All right. Okay, cool. There we go. Um, we always talk about readiness in the military. Always be ready. Ready for what? Well, might be getting ready for Oshkosh. It might be getting ready to go home from Oshkosh. Right? It might be getting ready to fly into a new airport with a new traffic pattern construction, stuff like that, make your own. Again, you know what you're good at. You know yourself. You know your capabilities. Uh, are you ready for, and, you know, the previous gentleman talked about the flight review. Are you, when's the last time you did a short and a soft field takeoff and landing? Like for real. Like for real. Like into a, that's going to be kind of kind of iffy. I'm not calling anybody out. Trust me. I fly a bunch of different airplanes. I'm like, yeah, I haven't flown a King Air in a while, and it's a pretty short airfield. Ugh. All right, I hope it goes well. Uh, or a power off 180, right? There's no currency for this, is there? Uh, uh, nope. Are you going to need to do a power off 180? I don't know. One day you might have to pull out of that bag going, yep, I'm good at that. ODPs, right? Obstacle departure procedures, if you're incident rated. Reading through some of those things. Can you make the climb gradient? I don't know. It's about 100 degrees in here right now. If you're loaded up, leaving Oshkosh, can you make it? I don't know. Can you make it back to your home field? Is there a SID or a star that you're going to worry about? So, again, what... What do, you, what do you want to get better at? And hopefully your instructors or your team or your partners or whatever are still talking about that. I think we covered that pretty amply. How did you prepare? Right? There's great videos. When I grew up, there wasn't this thing called YouTube and the Internet. There was a lot of books because so, I'm old. Uh, and there's so many great forums to learn all this stuff. Develop your SOP, your standard operating procedure. One thing we did in the Air Force is we would go to different, go to different places, but we would go to fly with a different unit Everything was the same, just like American Airlines that Brian's fly for, just like my company, we have an SOP. That way, if I jump from one airplane to the next with another pilot, we already know the flow, we already know what we're doing. Um, how do you do that? Look at your last 10 to 15 flights, develop that, write that stuff down, look for patterns, locations, and routine flights. I'm not saying ignore the checklist, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying there's a flow and there's an SOP. It might be let the engine stabilize this many minutes after touchdown, that sort of thing. This is what I'm going to do for the oils, et cetera, et cetera. Can you make your own in-flight guide? Sure, why not? You know, there's probably a really good one for Oshkosh. Okay, one thing in the Air Force, we had a unit, we had a squadron. We always had someone who was the training officer in charge of all the training of the pilots. When I was the commander of my training program, my training officer built the training program. Our examiner in the squadron, he was one of us, one of our, uh, one of our instructors who was a, an evaluator. He was able to give us check rides, and he evaluated the training program. But for your unit, right, that might be 
your buddy who owns the plane. That might be your flying club. That might be the, uh, air, the um, flight school that you rent out of. But find someone that can be your chief pilot. So, and it's really what it is, is somebody you can call and ask them a question. It might be your last CFI going, hey, I'm going to go into Oshkosh. I've never done this. This is what the NOTAM says. This is what I'm thinking. What do you think? Hey, this is my divert field. Does that make sense to you? I have students that still call me. They're like, hey, Tom, I'm doing this. I'm going here. What do you think? I'm like, ah, and what do you think about that? I still do that with, with the senior officers that I fly because they're mentoring me and I'm growing into the, into the other seat. You can find a training officer. There's wonderful opportunities here to connect at, uh, at Oshkosh, a local CFI. There's, there's tons of mentors. Mentoring is one of our pillars here at NAFI. If you don't know who your local FAST team rep is, I recommend that you find him or her, connect with them. There's the special interest groups at NAFI. I think we're up to seven or eight, 11. So, okay, there's pretty much something for everyone. Drones, seaplanes, instrument instructors, all that stuff. Uh, or join NAFI, right? Elevate your, and then with that in your in-flight, elevate your aeronautical decision-making, your uh, safety and single power risk management, your risk management skills. Continually look at that, look at your uh, SOP. And we would do this all the time in the Air Force. We would always look at risk management, risk management. We fill out a FRAT. Anyone not know what a FRAT? Anyone, know, anyone use FRAT, right? Flight risk assessment tool, it's fantastic. Our company that I fly for, we have a policy where we're going to wherever, you know, location X with the customer. We have to fill that FRAT out and have the boss look at it 48 hours out. That way we can go, okay, it's nighttime, it's dark, you know, there's small runway, we're near gross weight, et cetera, et cetera. So we can get ahead of the problems or at least talk the problem. Doesn't mean we're gonna cancel the flight. We may switch to a different airplane based on where we're going. But again, it's looking ahead and knowing yourself, knowing your aircraft and knowing when those two come together, eh, hey boss, I don't think I can do this. On a recent trip, I flew a King Air C90 from Virginia all the way to Montana with the owner and, and he's, he owns the plane. I'm just there to make sure, you know, as a safety pilot uh, and help him out. And his, his risk assessment is fantastic. He's like, yeah, I don't, I don't like that. We got plenty of gas. I don't like the way this weather's looking. So we diverted someplace else. Fantastic. You've just elevated your risk management. That's great. That's decision making. Uh, in the Air Force, we have things called training rules and knock it off. And really, all this is to say is that when you're out flying or training or when you've reached your limit, and you know you've reached your limit, it's probably a little late to divert. You know, if you're thinking about diverting, I was always taught, you know, you probably should have diverted earlier. But know when to stop. Because again, the theme here is know yourself, know what you're capable of, and know your aircraft, whether you fly multiples or one plane, you've built it, that's fantastic. And when those two come together, know when you're just like, yeah, I'm not going to go through that, or we're never going to make it around the backside of that. Or it's just too busy, or it's too hot, or it's too cold, things like that. And know when to call and knock it off. Research your area of operations, you know, and Bob Ross uh, over there, you know, says there's just happy little violations. Okay. You can also create what we call in the Air Force as an upgrade board. If you want to get a new skill, you know, upright, upright recovery uh, skills, basically taking a acrobatic airplane, learning all that, that's a new, that's not relatively new. I recommend if you have not had a chance to do that, there's plenty of schools that can do that. It'll just teach you some better airmanship skills. Go Air Force. All right, there, there's your tax paying dollars. Maybe there's just two of them today. All right, they'll be back. One of the most humbling flying experiences I ever had was the 1.0 in a Satabria. I'll tell you what, that was fantastic. It is very, very humbling, you know, because I've got habits and patterns and stuff like that. But go challenge yourself on a new skill. Seaplane reading, you can probably get them around here. You can get them down at Jack Brown's in Florida, places like that. But do something that challenges yourself and you create an up, you, you acquire a new skill. You'll be, you'll be surprised at what you learn. Again, build your unit, find a mentor, uh, and learn a new skill. That's what we're always trying to do is keep those skills sharp. Okay, the one thing we like to talk about in the Air Force is be brilliant at the basics, right? 
And what are those basics? That's knowing the aircraft, knowing what you can and cannot do with it in the critical phases of flight. I also like to talk about look for patterns, right? Sea gumps. I teach AAA and PPT, aim point airspeed and alignment. When we're trying to land an airplane, now that I fly jets, we've got this really cool thing called an AOA indicator, so I add that in there. And, and those are habits and patterns that we try to instill. Pitch power trim. There's thousands of hours of discussions on pitch power and trim, how to use that. I'm not going to get into that here. But again, it's about being brilliant at the basics of what you're doing and when you're doing it, why you're doing it, more importantly. Okay. If there's a weather day, one thing we did in the Air Force, if there was a weather day, the weather was too low to fly, we would do a pattern walk. We would understand in the pattern, out of the pattern. We would, under, we would basically put tape on the floor and follow the traffic pattern in and around the air, in and around the pattern. In the Air Force, they come up initial, which is about 1,500 feet over the runway, do a break, and then do a descending right-hand or left-hand turn into the pattern. When I was at the Air Force Academy, they have uh, three runways, and they have an inside, which is for the uh, tow planes. They have a middle, which is for the twin otter, where people jump out of that uh, for the skydiving. The outside runway is for the powered flight, right underneath Colorado Springs airspace. We put 13 airplanes in a downwind or in a uh, overhead traffic pattern. 13 airplanes underneath the class Charlie. That was pretty exciting. And then when someone doesn't go the right way or makes the wrong radio call or the timing and the cadence and the pacing is off, it gets real interesting. There's this really cool thing called Live ATC, which is great if you're learning about, you watch the videos on flying and flying the Fisk and ripping and all that stuff, wonderful videos. Uh, but if you can't go fly, find something to learn. Simulators, fantastic lifesavers. There's another plug for the special interest groups. Uh, Redbird's very powerful. PPC's got a bunch of them. Uh, you can do doing X playing on your on your laptop, other things like that. But again, be brilliant at the basics. Find patterns at work because in the military, you can see in some of those brownouts, we had to be very very good at just landing the helicopter and a little bit of drift either way. You go back to that minefield story, that would have had some serious consequences. So and we we credit that to our training and bonding as a crew. Okay, post flight kind of wrapping up here. It's all about the debrief, right? Who here thinks that the cockpit is a good classroom? All right, cool. I don't think it's a good classroom. So no rank of the room. I retired as an Air Force colonel, and when I was back uh, running a group of, of a bunch of different squadrons in Georgia, we had this. We have this rule in the Air Force, and I think most services do, where if I'm flying the helicopter or the aer airplane or whatever, and we get back and we do the post-flight debrief after a three- or four-hour flight, we would reconstruct, going, okay, this is what we did good, this is what we did bad, here's where we can prove. And the youngest airman on that aircraft who's younger than my daughters, right, 18, 19 year olds, could call me out in a professional way and say, hey, sir, that brownout you did, that was terrible. We were drifting left, you weren't responding to the calls. Does it get a little heated? Yeah, but again, we didn't have any rank in the room. So we empowered the youngest person to basically say, hey, that really wasn't good. And I would be hopefully be humble enough to go, yeah, you're right, I should have gone around on that one. But we created that culture, so I, I, I challenge you, if you go back to a flying club or flight school, Try to build that culture if it doesn't exist. Learn. And it's kind of hard to debrief yourself that way. Take somebody with you. And sometimes your best friends or your flight instructor will hold you accountable going, hey, that was, that was a great approach. Or, hey, you could do better on that. Uh, Third-party applications, Cloud Ahoy, ForeFlight, fantastic. GoPro, you, know, you strap those to the airplane. And basically, the big thing is just learn what you, uh, or watch what you've done. Learn. Find an accountability partner. Uh, own your mistakes. It's one thing we talked a lot about in the military is, hey, if it didn't go well, I would own up. You know, we try to be humble and going, yeah, that, that approach didn't go so well. I, and, but what we would say and what we would try to get to is, if I was going to go out and do this flight or this brownout next time, what would I do differently? How can I take that learning? Because if we don't, and, and some people record it, some people write it down, some people use flashcards, that's fine. Do whatever you need to do. But if you're flying out of Oshkosh, right, and you're going to plan on flying it next year, I'm probably sure that you're going to remember the things that you did well, you didn't do well, or going, oh, that's what they mean in X, Y, Z in the note, or oh, I forgot to bring this last year. Because um, sometimes it's repeatable. Sometimes it's, um, it's memorable. Again, the cockpit is really a good, uh, a good classroom. And then walk through and talk through the debrief. Hopefully, if you're learning a new skill, if you're a, uh, if you're a student, if you're working on a new certificate, you know, instrument, commercial, CFI, or whatever, um, hopefully your instructor is sitting down with you, or if you're just doing a flight review, 
challenge your instructor going, hey, I really want to be good at this. Help me get better at, 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 at this, whatever the issue is, whether it's power off 180, you know, a um, slow flight, steep turns. Uh, there's a direct connection with walking through and talking through and chair flying. And again, continually ask yourself, hey, if I was going to go do this same flight or fly into Oshkosh next year, what would I do differently? Or fly out of Oshkosh? Or take my family or try, you know, do a mountain course or something like that. And really the kind of the foot stomper here is to replay it in your mind. And again, you can use four flight, plow to hoy, all those uh, third party debriefs. You can use GoPro or whatever. Reflect going, yeah, all right, that could have gone better. And then really remember, this is how I was taught in the military. It's really served me well. Do I get everything right? Not even close. But do I try and get better every time? Yeah, that's the goal. So, and again, I, I recommend that GA pilots do that as well. One technique that you can do is we would pick good, better, best. I was good at X. I was good at power off 180s. I was better at steep spirals if you're doing commercial stuff. And I was, I was really great on shore field landings. Great. So pick things. Pick three things. I was good at X, I was better at Y, and I was best at Z. And then you can figure out, and you can see they're color-coded. I'd probably focus on the red first, maybe a little bit less on the yellow and the, and the green. Okay, I pretty much got that down. And again, you know what you're good at. Your instructor may know, but you know what you're good at and what you need help with. You go back to the brownout story. I didn't really like doing them, but I had to do them. I had to get, I had to get good. I had to get confident, but not cocky. Right? There's a big difference between those two, especially with that little minefield story. Another way to look at it is, what do I want to start doing? What do I want to stop doing? What do I want to continue doing? And again, I'm going to replay, I'm going to reflect, and I'm going to remember. That's all that this is really saying, just in a different way. There's a, there's a theory that I've had throughout my flying career, not always easy to do, but if you're going to do um, an hour of flying, you probably should prepare an hour of ground, whether that's pre and post, going, I'm gonna go out and, who's here is working on another certificate? Working on instrument, what are you guys working on? Commercial, there you go. So he has a way, I'm just gonna pick on you, gently. You have a way of preparing for the flight, okay, I'm gonna do lesson 52, it's Shondell's, Lazy 8, Steep Spirals, and Power Off 18s. cool. Maybe he chair flies them, maybe he does that, maybe he has a certain standard he wants to do, his instructor's probably saying, focus on this, here was good. But force your instructor to say, hey, what do I need to work on? What am I good at? What do I need to kind of not focus on? Hey, you're great on power off 180s. Awesome. Just remember, if we have any wind, it's going to fly differently. Steep spirals, a little bit different based on where you're starting, stuff like that. But if you can, it's not always easy, but use that hour of if you fly for an hour, study for an hour. Not always the easiest, especially if you're not working on anything. It doesn't have to be an hour, but I challenged my students when I was instructing a little bit more than I am now, I said, hey, go prepare because you're protecting yourself, which is the ultimate investment. Write it down, be honest. You can use voice notes on your phone. That's what I've started to doing because there's just, I don't have time to write things down. What did you accomplish? Uh, and really it's all about protecting the investment, which is you. You're spending a lot of money to go fly an airplane, to put loved ones on, family, friends, etc., on that airplane. So continually try to improve and get better. Perfect. Okay. All right, so we're wrapping up. We're kind of in the final turn here. So really, again, I think I've beat this one uh, like a dead horse. Know yourself, know your capabilities. I knew what I was okay at in the Air Force. Again, I didn't like doing brownouts, but we had to get good. We, we, we trained a lot, and that stuff kept us alive over there. Same thing when I was teaching cadets how to fly a Cirrus 20. Hey, here's a couple things you might see because when they go in the pattern solo with 12 other airplanes, they got to know what to do. Same thing, there's thousands of airplanes flying in and out of Oshkosh. You studied, you took the time, so keep those behaviors up. Know your aircraft, right? Maybe just a quick review. You don't have to read the whole thing all at one sitting because you'll probably fall asleep like most of us. Just pick a chapter, right? Read the emergency procedures, read normal procedures. When's the last time you read the weight and balance? I don't know. That's cool. Maybe you know the airplane, but you may be surprised at what you learn when you start going back and looking at things. Again, sometimes the POH is pretty big, so just take a little bit at a time. Make a plan. Develop your team, right? That team could be your local CFI, your flying partner, your, your flying club. Learn a new skill. Challenge yourself. Yeah, that takes money, but I'll tell you, that one hour I had in the Satabria, whew, that was very humbling. Um, it, it was just good. I used a whole different part of my brain and my hands and my feet to just, just make me better. It was great. 
Make your own readiness program, right? We talked about flight reviews. There's been a lot of discussion on flight reviews. You know what you're not good at. You can customize a flight review, right? There's certain requirements you gotta do. And you don't have to do one every 24 months, right? You can do one every month if you want. Find a partner, maybe split some time. Make your own program. Debrief yourself, learn from every flight, record what you've learned, protect your investment, which is you being the best you can to fly your loved ones to and from locations and really enjoy the freedom of flying and have fun. There you go. And then you can see the key word up there is you and you're the key to safe flying, you know? Um, and, and I encourage you just to, just to keep going, learn from others. There's my email. Uh, that's who I am. And before we open to questions, I'd just like to do a couple plugs. Can we get a round of applause for Brian over here? Brian Schiff. No, I'm serious. He is the man behind setting all this up, so please, if you get a chance to thank him, uh, he is the reason why this, these, these briefings and these sessions are very successful. All the volunteers in the back, can we get a round of applause for them? If you're not a member of NAPI, I encourage you to join. I think it's $54. Yeah, $5 off here. $5 off. If you're, even if you're not an instructor, you don't have to be an instructor to join NAFI. I encourage you to join. We talked about the special, special interest groups, the magazines, the content, Mentor Live. Uh, what questions, comments do you have, if any? I have a question. So at the airlines, it becomes very non-punitive to self-evaluate, and if you are not fit for flight, to remove yourself. I try to push that to GA pilots to do the same thing, but I'm, my question is, is the military pretty good about that now? Yeah, or, or do you feel pressured to fly? No, um, it depends. Um, you know, I'll give you a, a couple uh, combat, one's combat story and then one training. When we're home, right, we're training, no one's really getting shot at, we, we'll do all that stuff. If you're sick, people just go, okay, I'll, I, I can't fly. We usually would have spare pilots and air crew men that we could say, hey, Tom can't fly, so you're gonna go jump in the seat. Great, that's fine. In a deployed environment, we were so thin on people it, it became a little bit more difficult, but there were times where we had, we had an alert posture where we had to respond in a certain amount of time and a certain amount of area to go get the, uh, the injured. There would be times where we were just flying so much and sleeping so little because it's hot, you're in a tent, you know, and you're doing it for 150 days straight, 12 on, 12 off. So we would basically just, we'd tap out for a day going, we, we have to have a break because we're too, we're, we are beyond what we have thought we could do and we're more dangerous if we fly and no fault no punitive no it, it usually is when i was the commander i would call my boss who's some general i'd be like hey boss here's the deal we got to go off alert for 12 hours we got to reset we are exhausted i mean these guys were in the seat sometimes 12 hours a day non-stop flying in and out doing doing brownouts like that all the time for 150 days straight it takes its toll so there was a couple times we just had to take a knee took a break no harm no foul um, and he was actually thankful that we kind of raised our hand and said, hey, we, we, we need a break. We're, we're, you know, so imagine in this kind of heat and humidity where full flight suit, body armor, helmet, sitting in an aircraft for 12 hours a day, do that for 150 straight days, which were the short ones. So, so, so there was, no, there was no, uh, no punishment, no detriment. Well, that's good. Yeah. If you want another hour in a Sotabria, come <laughs> fly mine with me. Yes, sir. I'll finish my tailwheel. Okay, any other questions, comments? Yep. There's my email over there. There's cards up yeah. here. Quite That's for the Wings over, credit. Question over here. Yes, sir. So, you know, with the airline industry, professional flying, they have to research your flying background, correct? Yep. Because there's a law that says that. So when do we start documenting that in GA training? When do we start documenting? So you said good, better, best. What if we have a student who's bad, can't meet ACS standards, or displays really terrible aeronautical decision making and how do you document that oh i'd say a couple things um my experience for in the ga world if you have a 141 program there's checks it's a little bit easier to do that because there's you know there's an approved tco a syllabi there's check airmen i would say if you're a part 61 flight instructor i was just talking to another gentleman yesterday um you know you can follow a syllabi um and what I would do on, as a 61 instructor or an independent, I would have maybe my, a friend of mine independently check my students and just get another person to look at them. And then sometimes if the student, the learner, cannot meet the ACS after multiple times, then, it, then sometimes you just have to have that hard conversation going, 
hey, student X, I'm sorry, but this is the standard. I'm not going to sign you off. I've had to do that multiple times. Those are not easy conversations, but I try to approach it with a little bit of empathy going, you're, I need you to be here, and you're here. This is what I need you to do, right? Because their goal is to put their family in the airplane. I said, I cannot. So, so do you document that in writing or not? Because if they can't meet the standard? Yes. Sometimes I have. Other times I have not. Okay. It's a good way to stay out of legal trouble. It, it is. I was just having a conversation about CFI records with a gentleman here the other day, and it's. But sometimes you have to politely fire your student, you know. And there's times I've even given flight reviews where they tell me one thing and they do another, and I've called them up and I said, "Don't ever do that again." X, Y, and Z. You know, he he flew beyond his weatherman's in a rented aircraft, and it didn't. He made it, but it didn't go well. The owner was really upset of the flight school. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Cool. I'll be up here for a few minutes. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Enjoy Oshkosh.